We're privileged. I know because Jack's been sharing with me how much work he's put into this presentation. It's a lot of its research that he's been doing for many years. Um, Jack's been part of the Glasgow Hammer Dulcimer scene for decades, in fact, a key part of it. And we're actually privileged to be able to listen today to him talk to us about the old players and his experience with them and how he went about collecting all of their material and hear some of the fabulous playing. So, Jack, thank you very much. I'm going to hit record now. Um, well, first, off, first of all, I was asked to do a talk on the Glasgow tradition. But in actual fact, as I've been going through the newspaper archives, um, the Dulcimer was actually known throughout the whole of Scotland and very popular, particularly in the, the 19th century. So the first part of the talk, I thought I would go through some of the newspaper archives just to give examples of the kind of place where you would be able to hear a Dulcimer being played or some of the people that were playing them. There's also a couple of wee stories in it that are maybe a, a sideline, but I thought they were interesting enough to include. So, to begin off, the, the, first, um, the first example that I found of a record of the Dulcimer being mentioned in Scotland was in 1765 in Aberdeen. And you can see from this advert from the Aberdeen Journal, Joseph Ruddiman was making instruments in Aberdeen, one of which was Dulcimer. And the advert underneath was David Geddes was teaching these the same instruments, the guitar, violin, German flute, psaltery, and dulcimer. And part of the significance for me in that is that it must have been a well enough known instrument. There was no need to explain what it was and just to say that he was making them and that somebody was teaching them. Moving on from there, in 1787, this was a bit of a, obviously a bit of a novelty act, but uh, Mr. Nicholson, he taught, among other things, three cats to play <laughs> the strikes of little tunes on the dulcimer with their paws and to imitate the Italian manner of singing. He actually, he, he, does me. <laughs> he, he actually taught loads of, loads of different animals to, to play different instruments and to do different tricks, different feats. But the, the reason I included that, really, was, you know, just to, to give an example of something in the um, 1700s. There were quite a few mentions of the dulcimer at that period. Instruments for sale was the, the, the most common. Moving into the 19th century, it began to become more apparent in the newspapers. And this particular one, it's actually two dulcimer players from London who came up and played in Edinburgh. And they were so popular that um, some of the, the newspaper reviews say that people were queuing along the length of the street to get tickets to go in. So without actually going through the, the, the whole thing to tell you about it, it's the directors of Musard, Musard concerts who put on different types of musical events had brought the, the Messrs Nelson. And on the first night, it was a private audience for people to, to approve how good they were. And they, they say the elder Nelson particularly was at once acknowledged to be a talented musician. His power over his instrument the rapidity and at the same time the accuracy of his execution exceeded anything we had ever heard. So it gives you an idea. They were impressed. Um, the next one goes on. Now, the reason I've included this is it's unusual to find a description of an instrument at that period. And here was a description of their instruments. And the significant parts have highlighted the uh, on the belly. And respectively, parallel to the ends of the instrument, there are fixed two rows of wooden pins. It, these are actually the bridges that they're talking about. And we go on to the next paragraph, it says, the pins being beveled or brought to an edge at the top serve as bridges to elevate the supported strings. So that would suggest to me it's chessmen bridges. I don't know if, if, uh, if everybody's familiar with chessmen bridges. I know they're most commonly used on the East Anglian Dulcimers, but they were used. And this is... A chessman bridge. I don't know if you can see that from an old uh, Scottish dulcimer that I have, mm -hmm. and it's you can see it's beveled at the top, and it has a small uh, piece of brass embedded into it. So it, it gives us a good description of a four-string instrument, four strings per course, and that is still 
the instruments that were being played in Glasgow in the nine, up to the nineteen seventies, nineteen eighties, they were very similar. Most of them had three or four strings per note. Very few of them, the ones in Glasgow, had chessmen bridges, but there were one. I have seen one or two. And at the bottom of the page, he also describes the hammers. And again, this is really unusual to find a description of hammers at that period. Slight slips of cane about six inches long and carved at one end. The strings are struck with a carved end, which is muffled by a thread being twisted around it. And my first thought on that was, uh, again, the East Anglian dulcimers. Uh, any photographs I've seen of them, it's cane, but it's not carved at the end, it's wound. The, the cane is wound in, in a loop. So that then made me think about uh, some of the older Glasgow players that used cane. And the cane they used, it's, it's more like a garden cane, where they carve out the handle and leave the end as, as a round piece. And this is one here, which I'll try and show you. Um, this particular one has a piece of mandolin fret wire set in it to make it harder, but... Uh, most of them didn't play like that, but that, and it has flexibility as well. So, to say, I thought it was quite important to have these descriptions because 100 years later, or well, 150 years later, they were still playing mm -hmm. very much the same. The next part is equally as important because it gives us the programme of what they were playing, what kind of music they were playing. And then the, the first part of the programme, you can see the music that they're playing here. Miss Inverarity was the, the guest singer for the evening. But in the second part of the, their concert, they played some Scottish tunes as well. So I guess that would be to uh, entertain the audience in Edinburgh. The Nelson Brothers played to a full house for several months. They say that they, um, they were incredibly popular, and there are newspaper reviews, numerous newspaper reviews of these performances. But you know, towards the bottom, the author couldn't help but adding his own his own take on it. To, he wasn't a fan of the dulcimer. The tone of the dulcimer is much inferior to that of a modern piano, and is not unlike that of those tinkling -like instruments which are performed by itinerant foreigners in our streets but the rapidity and precision with which the Messrs Melton sweep over its chords excites the astonishment of all who hear them. The next few slides, um, I decided there was no point in, in showing every slide. I could, could have had hundreds of slides on it. So it's just to give an idea of the places you could hear it and how widespread it was over Scotland. So this is from Arbroath in 1855, Arbroath Total Abstinence Society. And the abstinence societies increased in popularity, temperance movements, and they seem to put on a lot of concerts with dulcimers in them because there are literally hundreds of reviews of them. And this one tells us that Mr. Gardner played. Um, another one here, back down to Paisley. And again, it's another a different example. This time it's a, a works annual dinner for the staff, annual dance or concert. And we have a dulcimer playing there as well. The next one is a bit of a, I was hoping that I would be able to make some connection between Burns and the dulcimer. And I couldn't make any direct connection. This is the closest I got. And the, the background story to it is that uh, David Sellers was Burns' bosom buddy when they were in their youth and they were in drinking and womanizing and the things that Burns is famous for. And uh, David Sellers was his, his drinking buddy. He was also a good fiddle player, very good fiddle player by all accounts, and Burns um, praised his fiddle playing. But through uh, several failed business ventures, he ended up in the debtor's jail in Irvine. But after he came out of the jail, he was a changed man who decided he had to, had to be a, a bit more sensible about things. And as luck would have it for him, his brother, who had a very successful business in India, died and left him a lot of money. So with his money, he started new businesses. He bought properties to make money from the rent and became respectable. And the author of this story wasn't too impressed by that because he says, uh, over whose fiddle all the vagabond tunes of his country had met in glorious harmony, became a town councillor of Irvine. 
Dainty Davy, the breaker of laws, the harem scarum minstrel of the rockings, transformed into a belly. Oh, what a falling off was there. The worst was yet to be told. He who had sung the praises of water, now in the heyday of his prosperity, discarded the honest devil may care fiddle for the flimsy, egotistic, lisping dulcimer, utterly and miserably lost. <laughs> so he wasn't a fan of the dulcimer either, was he? And the next uh, one takes us up to Aberdeen in 1889. And who wouldn't want to see the polyphonic instrumentalist and lightning manipulator, Mr. Hayward. And uh, he had his, his uh, party trick was playing with his eyes covered with a handkerchief. <laughs> so they're, they're up until that point, you know, there are an increase in number, and towards the end I'll show you some of the, some of the figures, but an increase in number appearing in the newspapers the reviews of all these concerts been all over the place, really. Another one in 1890, this time from Shetland. But this is, this is a bit of an anomaly here, but I've included it because it's the furthest north that I could find a reference. But it tells about a school picnic, a Sunday school pic picnic. And uh, after the, the picnic, they have games and sports. And the prizes consisted of money, dolls for the young bairns, ships for the boys, dulcimers, pin cushions, knickknacks. So, you know, I don't think that's dulcimers as we know them. I can only assume it's some kind of musical toy that they, uh, that they refer to as the dulcimers. Um, still in the 1890s, Inverness, Banffshire, you know, Tain, Tain this one, um, a concert organised by Sir Charles and Lady Ross to raise funds for the Seaforth Boys Brigade. The significance in this one, apart from being so far north, was the fact that most of them up to now have been in working class environments. But this one, where the song sung by the Countess of Cromarty met with a good reception, also did her performance on the dulcimer. So we have maybe a, a more of a parlour instrument than, than the itinerant buskers. The next one, again in the 1890s, this one is the Banffshire Herald. And it's just, it's about a busker playing in Dingwall and how popular it was, how the, the crowds turned out to see him and he uh, made a lot of money from it. And also another one uh, from the Dundee advertiser describing it was a dulcimer for sale, three octave, four strings to each note, tuned in G, fine powerful tone, beautiful inlaid, cost 48 shillings, 425 shillings. So again, I'd say I've included this to show the range of where they were being found. We've now found it in Tain and Banff and Dundee and Glasgow and Paisley and Ayrshire. The next one, uh, Airdrie Lodge number 1070 IOGT. Now, I wondered about this at first if this was going to be some you know, a Masonic Lodge or something, but IOGT is the International Order of Good Templars. So it's another temperance movement. Mr. William McNally, the champion dulcimer player. Now, William McNally was no doubt the most famous Scottish dulcimer player, sometimes billed as the dulcimer king. In later years, he often spent the summer in Oban and played on the ferries serving the Western Isles. And about 2012, I was playing at a, a concert. Um, for, it was a pensioner's Christmas night, actually. And I was playing with a fiddle group and they asked me if I would take the dulcimer and play. And there was a woman approached me there and she told me that her aunt and uncle lived in Oban and she used to spend her summers there. And she said Mr McNally used to come and stay with them because her uncle played the dulcimer as well. And the two of them would sit and play. And uh, unfortunately, I never took a note of his name. But, you know, here we have it again up the West Coast in Oban. It was well, well known there. Um, back to Dundee. Dundee Courier, a high-class concert and variety entertainment was given in the drill hall in Boyrathal. I found this one interesting because it's the first mention I've came across of not being solo dulcimer because most of them it's all been, or all of them so far, it's been solo dulcimer. And this was the Waverly Trio with mandolin, dulcimer and piano. So it would be interesting to find out more about the Waverly Trio, but I haven't been able to find anything about that. 
back up north, further north, up to um, Fraserborough. Special engagement of Belasco, the celebrated London instrumentalist and champion dulcimer soloist, who has performed before King Edward VII and challenges the world as a dulcimer soloist. I don't quite know what challenge in the world is, but uh, it must have been it must have been uh, quite a sight and quite a performance. Back down again to Motherwell, and this is again another bit, maybe a wee bit offbeat story, but it's a story about uh, the town hall, Motherwell town hall, and the lesser hall was being hired for a dance, and it transpired that the people hiring it wanted to have a melodeon and a dulcimer playing, but the the council had decided, as it says, the authorities in charge of the letting are plebeian in their tastes, but they bar the melodeon, dulcimer, juice harp, mouth harmonium, or a combination of hair comb and newspaper. <laughs> Interestingly enough, for the following year, there was an election in Motherwell, and uh, one of the candidates, Mr Grant, was asked if he would be in favour of melodeon and dulcimer accompaniment at dances in the town hall, and Mr Grant said, certainly yes, Many a time I have had sore feet dancing to Melodian. I favour that just as much as a string band. Needless to say, the, the dulcimer was allowed again because, again, Motherwell, that area, there are numerous uh, references to dulcimer, and dulcimer and Melodian became a very popular combination for dances, for weddings, for any public occasion, really. Um, moving on to the next one. I'm into the 20s now, 1920s. 1924, BBC Radio Glasgow started broadcasting dulcimer music. And it's hard to imagine now how much, how popular it was really. William McNally, who we've already discussed, was broadcasting. And these programmes went on into the 1940s. In fact, probably beyond that. Uh, and the second one, WF Cornelius, was also um, broadcasting on the BBC at that time. In actual fact, going forward through the records, WF Cornelius played broadcast a lot more than anybody else. His name comes up all the time. And also he plays in, played in Edinburgh, Aberdeen, all over Scotland. His name from now on until the 1940s, his name comes up all the time. But I've been unable to find out anything about him whatsoever other than that he was kept busy. Um, another one, Bells Hill, which again is Lanarkshire. But the interest in this one was, again, it's William McNally. But it said he played over several Scottish songs and accompanied them with fine imitation of the bagpipes. How do you do an impersonation of the bagpipes? On the dulcimer, I don't understand at all, but I've seen that reference to quite a few different dulcimer players where they've said they, they, they did an imitation of the bagpipes. I know there was one that I knew that I was told about and he played, it was like a pipe band in the distance and they came closer and then passed by. And I had assumed that they were, they were impersonating maybe the drumming style or the pipe band drummers or something. But to say that uh, it was a fine imitation of the bagpipes, I haven't a clue what that means. 1930, this, this one, um, James Redpath, he was still playing up in the 1960s, and he's the father of Gene Redpath, who was a, a very well-known folk singer. I, I don't know if people have heard of her. But um, the School of Scottish Studies have recordings of James Redpath, and I'm, trying, I'm, I'm linked to one just now, which is James playing and Gene Redpath singing. And I'm sure you'll recognise the song. Come along, come along, let us forth and out and gather. Come along, come along, be it fair or stormy weather. For the hills are found before us and the buffalo are feather. Let us sing in happy chorus, come along, come along. Is the call of sea and shore, is the smell of fog and peat, 
this the scent of briar and myrtle that puts magic in our feet for it's on we go rejoicing over black and over style soon we will be tramping with the last long mile come along come along let us put it all together come along come along be it fair or stormy weather with the hills of home before us and the buffalo or a feather with a singing happy chorus come along come along Yeah, so um, it was interesting to find that there are um, recordings in the School of Scottish Studies with uh, James Redpath playing. Uh, the next one I'm going to go into is through in Fife as well, where uh, James Redpath was. This time it's Jimmy Scott, Scotland's premier dulcimer player and BBC broadcaster. And from this period on, Jimmy Scott does become the, uh, the main man for... BBC Broadcasting and for variety concerts um, played with people like the Alexander Brothers. Um, I've got a wee bit, I'll play some music and give you a chance to read the, the page. The, the style that Jimmy Scott is playing in was pretty much the style that um, some of the people that came to the People's Palace in Glasgow, Willie Burke and a few other people played in very similar style to that. The next one, the, Dulce, the Douglas Water Dance Band, is a photograph of the 1940s. Douglas Water um, is a, a village in South Lanarkshire. So, and again, it's an example of the type of band that would be playing at a lot of dances and weddings with accordions and dulcimer. Um, the, all, the, all the archives that I've gone through refer to solo dulcimers, and at these events, we'll also say that a band provided music for dance. And there's every possibility that there are dulcimers in the bands as well, but they don't specify the, the lineup for the band or the names of the musicians or anything. So it, I thought this was quite an important record because I don't haven't seen any other photograph of a band with a dulcimer in that period. This one is just an example of how the instances of the dulcimer being mentioned in the newspaper archive increased over the 1800s and the 1900s. And I suppose we should be careful and that this is only the newspaper archives and there would have been a lot of players who never appeared in newspapers. There would have been a lot of players who only played at home for their own entertainment, and there would have been other players who played at local events that weren't reported in the papers. But you can see from 1900 to 1949, it was 3,411. And then 1950 to 59, it dropped to 323. I don't believe for a minute that uh, all these dulcimer players had stopped playing or that they'd stopped having these events. I think a lot of the reason for that as a change in the newspapers. Maybe some of the local newspapers went out of business. Maybe the, the bigger papers were covering a bigger area and stuck to more mainstream news and didn't have to include articles about, you know, church soirees and, and things like that. Also, a lot of the newspapers from that period to now haven't been included on the archive yet either. So there, there could be more to come. So the last um, slide I'm going to use on this part, oh, something's happened to you. Uh, Jimmy Cooper and started a bit too soon there. Um, Jimmy Cooper was a big influence on me starting to play the dulcimer because he was the first dulcimer player I ever heard. And I'll play the track now and give you a chance to read the, the page. Thank you. 
So there we go, end of part one. <laughs> um, before I move on to part two, I don't know if anybody wants to have any discussion on what we've seen so far, any comments or questions? Or... Well, I always think it's interesting that, that the kind of British thing is that people play tunes and the American way now is very much chordal, much more than, uh, you know, I think when I was learning at the beginning, Jimmy Cooper and and uh, people like that weren't playing. You know, they were playing tunes really, rather yeah. than yeah. sort of chordal backgrounds for things. I think to to me as well, listening to to Jimmy Cooper, I think he he was a really good player. No doubt Absolutely. about that. How good must have William McNally have been or W. F. Cornelius? And I know there are recordings of uh, William McNally, but I've never managed to get a hold of any. But I would I'd really like to hear them. But the, the, the aspect about the playing uh, the chordal accompaniment, some of the some of the players in the Glasgow group, but one in particular, Wally Burke, uh, it'll come to you later anyway. But he said if he was playing along with a melodeon, quite often he would just vamp. And I tried to get him to give me examples of that, but we never really got that far. But uh, so I think they you know they also, also did some. If they didn't know the tune, maybe they would just kind of play some chords along. Hmm. Sorry, Bill, you were going to ask. Yeah, it's great to hear um, um, William um, Cooper. I was I was just um, thinking that um, one of the other players that um, greatly impressed me in that early period were recordings that were made by Bob Smith's Ideal Band. Yeah, they were recording nineteen thirties. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how they would fit into the, your narrative, whether you'd miss <laughs> them out for some reason or. Uh, yes, I, I've got it. Yeah. I've got the the. Uh, the I actually, I'm, I meant to mention that uh, uh, when I was I got when I was the, talking about the bands. The I meant to mention that uh, about Bill, uh, Bob Smith's ideal band as well because the, the, the cassette of it I got so it just shows how far uh, uh, was. But it was some very impressive recordings. I, I regret I can't remember the name of the guy who was playing, but he was sort of incorporated in what was part of a, a hugely popular band. At least that's the impression I got. Yeah. It was well. I think Bob Smith himself played the dulcimer on some tracks, and um, J. B. Andrews, I think, was the other dulcimer player on it. Um, but they did, they did, and Jimmy Scott, when I spoke about him, he played in this. Uh, it was more like variety than than certainly wasn't folk music. It was a variety scene with the Alexander Brothers, um, maybe Andy Stewart, these kind of people, and it was a it was a concert party tour sort of thing that they did. Yes, some of the tracks had very much that feel about it, sort of novelty acts that are probably best forgotten about. But there were other bits that are really good, solid dulcimer playing. You say that that hits the spot, it's really good. But I, I, I didn't know how they fitted into uh, the tradition you're talking about. Yeah, it's, oh, yeah. A, it's a strange one because well, Walt Mills uh, commented about um, maybe we're too elitist in the folk scene and. You know, we dis discounted that type of music as not being authentic, and I think I was certainly guilty of that. Although I really liked it, also, I didn't like the type of music. Mm. Yeah. Uh, hello, Jack. Uh, Hi. Yeah, I, I used to listen to my dad play the dulcimer seventy years ago. Yeah. And he would play mainly Irish and Scottish tunes. Yeah. But uh, and I don't know much about. His instrument, I know it was huge and it was standing up straight and he stood tall whilst he, whilst he yeah. played. But my sister uh, told me that she used to love it when he played the Blue Danube. Yeah, no, I can yeah. believe that, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, uh, there was a difference in, 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 you know, that's that's different from Scottish and Irish, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think uh, most of them, like Jimmy Cooper, certainly, uh, William McNally, now, one of the, the radio broadcast from later on gave a, a set list and it was all Scottish and Irish tunes mm. that he was playing. Yeah. But I think they were also versatile and yeah. they would play popular songs of the day that, that people wanted to hear. Yeah. You know, I think yeah. they were versatile and they would do both. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. And certainly yeah. When, when we move on to the Glasgow Dulcimer group, most of the players coming in there, they, they played things that had been popular when they were younger, movie mm. themes and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll move on to the, the second part then. The Glasgow Dulcimer Group. 
to see how I do this. <laughs> oh, I need to stop here first of all. Isn't I? Okay, <clears throat> well, I've got a, a, a brief thing about uh, the beginnings, how, how it started. And um, hold on, I seem to have lost the. Uh, Okay, I'm back on track. Yeah, it was a, a brief description of how it started. Really, Colin McAllister, who was a, a singer with the band I played in Satanta, uh, had been telling me stories about an Antrim. He knew quite a few dulcimer players there would come out after the dance. It finished at night time. They would set up tables and put dulcimers on them and play. And at that time, we were playing quite a lot in Glasgow and Lanarkshire area. And there were quite a few occasions when people approached me and said, oh, my father played, or my grandfather played, or, you know, I've got one of them under the bed, but I don't know what to do with it, sort of thing. And Colin had the idea that we should set up a group and find out a, a bit more about the history of it. Uh, on the day when we had the first meeting in the People's Palace, there was about 25 people, eight of them were dulcimer players, so we were amazed. And they were really keen to, to get together and play because all of them thought they were the only ones still playing and they never heard of anybody else playing the dulcimer. So uh, that was uh, the dulcimer group began. So I'll give a wee bit about some of the, the original members. Wally Buck, I, I'll play a wee track of Wally and you can have a wee read it, what, you, what he was about. Yeah, so uh, Wally was a, a, a player, he, he was, I think, maybe 85 when he was in that, in the Dulcimer group, but um, he had been playing since he was a, a young boy. And he told me about uh, if they were playing, if he was playing with melodians, he'd sometimes just vamp and if he didn't know the tune. Um, he also, you know, told us a few stories about McNally and, and different people. And his nephew, uh, John Crichton, had, uh, had learned from Wally, and he's another really good player, which I'll let you hear a bit of. And that, that gives you a, a, another idea of the, the, the kind of stuff that they were playing. Uh, another one, Jimmy McDonald. Jimmy was from Coatbridge in Lanark, so no, I'll play a wee bit of Jimmy and you can read the story there. Jimmy was a, a bit of a character. Um, in 1985, I think it was, it was a Hungarian week in Glasgow. And part of that, they had two cymbalum players. 
and they played in the Glasgow City Chambers and I got tickets, got my tickets, so I took Jimmy along to see the Cymbalon players and he was well impressed, but um, at the interval, they, everybody went into the next room for a cup of tea and a, a sandwich or whatever and Jimmy said, I want to have a look at these instruments. So he went up and he sat down at one of the cymbalons and he took out his cane hammers, the same as the, the, the ones I was showing you earlier, and he took them out and he started finding out where the notes were. And then he started playing, I belong to Glasgow, and the Northern Lights of Aberdeen. And people were coming back in and sitting down and gave him a round of applause. And then there was a, a young man came in and he said, um, you're welcome to, to play the instrument at the end of the night, but we're a bit concerned you knock it out of tune. Would you mind not playing anymore? And Jimmy stood up and he said, that's fine, son. I've just fulfilled my life's ambition. And uh, he got a big round of applause. And I'm sure that young man was wishing the ground could swallow him up. In the second half, he fell asleep and uh, maybe he's sat with his head against my shoulder snoring. <laughs> Frank and Willie Brown. Frank and Willie were uh, two brothers that lived in Rutherglen. And well, I'll let you read the story there. That's another example of uh, the type of music that they played in the dulcimer group because these they loved these tunes. Uh, these were that was one of the one of the favourite tunes. They always played that when they got together. And uh, Frank and Roy, I used to sometimes give them a lift home with their dulcimers from the People's Palace because the uh, other gun was on my way home anyway. And they always got me to drop them off at the corner of the road. They wouldn't let me take them into the street and drop them off at their house. They always get dropped off. And every time I dropped them off, I'd say, I'll, I'll take you around, it's, it's only, you know, no, no, we're fine here. And it was about a year before I found out the reason for that was that they were going to the pub. They were taking their dulcimers to the pub to have a wee session, a wee tune and play. But, you know, they obviously didn't want me to go with them. <laughs> or they certainly weren't inviting me anyway. Um, the next one is just some, some photographs of uh, the group. And when we, when we started meeting initially, the People's Palace has a big uh, glass conservatory on the back of the Winter Garden. And that was closed for a long time because it, um, the roof was unsafe. But eventually, 1985, they had repaired the roof and they were able to open the Winter Garden. And that's uh, the People's Palace with the, the Winter Garden on the back. So we were able to move into that and it was a much better place to play. We could all sit in a big semicircle or spread out. And this is uh, a couple of them. Well, this is you know, sort of core, the core of the group. The people sitting playing here, Nan Kirkpatrick, uh, the first the lady on the left, uh, she was a retired school teacher and she played the piano and I think her father had played the dulcimer and she had decided to take it up and she came along to the dulcimer group and Jimmy McDonald and some of the others were helping her to learn to play. Um, John Crichton there and Jim Barr sitting at the end beside John Crichton had been making dulcimers, they got a set of plans and they had made a few 
and um, on the, the photograph on the right, that's Jim closest to us with one of these dulcimers. And he would make them and string them up. And then John Creighton would take them away and tune them for him. Andy Fagan was another. Andy had the dulcimer um, probably from 1915, 1916, or something like that. And again, he played in the family band. He's, he got the, the, the job of being the dulcimer player. Um, he said his hands were too small to play the fiddle. And uh, Jenny Coxon actually did uh, an interview with Andy. Oh, rather, the Dulcimer Group did an interview with Andy, and Jenny Coxon transcribed it for us. And it was published in, in the uh, Nonsuch newsletter, but I'll, I'll come to that later on. I'd like to hear a bit of Andy's point. Andy had actually stopped playing the dulcimer in the 1950s. He also played the accordion and he's still, he's still playing that. But uh, when he was, I think, 67, he was invited to Canada to his niece's wedding and they decided they wanted to learn the bagpipes to go. And he did. He learned the, the bagpipes to go and play at the wedding. And when he came back, um, we gave the, it was the pipe major of the Glasgow Police Pipe Band that had been teaching him. And when he gave him the bagpipes back, uh, he told Andy to keep them and conditioned that he would teach the Boys Brigade the pipes. So he became a, a tutor for the Boys Brigade. And he wrote a march for the Boys Brigade centenary, which was played at the celebrations. And back to John Crichton again. Um, this is him playing one of Jim Barr's dulcimers. This is just a, a photograph to let you see a bit more of what the, the environment was like in the People's Palace for people sitting playing. And it was nice. Eventually, they opened up a cafe and they had a, a seated area for people to come in there. And that made it a lot more of the public came in and listened to the music and came over and chatted to the musicians. And it was good. The, the group went on for, for quite a long time. But um, unfortunately, my job, I had to work a lot of Saturdays. So I, from about 1988 onwards, I think I was very seldom in. Um, we had quite a few concerts for the Dulcimer group in different locations. These ones were in the People's Palace. And this was uh, Wally Buck, John Crichton, and I don't know who the accordionist was, but uh, they had played in the 60s and the 70s as the Uddingstonians. And I've included this here so we can hear the difference between the Odingstonians and the Ray family from Northern Ireland. And the Ray family from Northern Ireland um, were actually they were related to John Ray, and I'm sure some of you have heard some of John Ray's recordings. And uh, quite remarkably, the, the dulcimers were, were modelled on John's, but they actually sound very like listening to John's playing as well.
Um, yeah, I think the the older, I think it was George and David were the two the two brothers, and I think George Senior was um, a cousin of John Ray's. But they they referred to me as Uncle John, and this was a tune that they'd learned from Uncle John. And this was uh, the finale of that concert with uh, the Ray family and the, the Glasgow Dogs Summer Group. Um, as I say, we did have quite a few concerts, and uh, one of the concerts we had was uh, Heather Corbett was uh, the guest. Heather plays the cymbal, on, and uh, she had a pianist to accompany her, and she had somebody to turn their music for her, and it cost us a fortune. <laughs> but it was on the condition that we didn't record it, so we don't have any recordings from the, the concert, or photographs for that matter. But another one was... Um, with Jim Cousa as the main guest, and I'm sure a few of you will be familiar with Jim. But uh, unfortunately, I don't have any recordings of Jim playing. I don't have any recordings from this concert except for myself and Maggie McInnes on the class act. So I can play a wee bit of that. And that was the finale, which unfortunately wasn't recorded either at that concert. There was actually, there were two other musicians played at that, uh, Willie Burke and John Crichton played, but uh, they wouldn't stay long enough for the finale, they were away to the pub. I mentioned uh, Andy Fagan, I mentioned uh, Jenny Cox and trans transcribing Andy's interview. And uh, one a very significant thing that Andy said, every second or third house he went to in Coatbridge, Bells Hill, Motherwell, all minors with no radio in these days. And of course, if they didn't play a melodeon or a mouth organ, they'd play the dulcimer. The, you know, part of the significance of that is, at the, at the start of this, I said that uh, I'd been asked to do a talk on the Glasgow tradition. But as I started to look through the newspaper archives, it became clear that it wasn't just a Glasgow tradition, it was throughout Scotland, but if you include Lanarkshire and Greater Glasgow, then I would say that is the Glasgow tradition because it continued much longer in Glasgow and Lanarkshire than it did in the rest of the country. Lanarkshire in particular, um, any time I've played at weddings or functions in Lanarkshire in particular, I still get people even up to a couple of years ago telling me that their grandfather or great uncle played the dulcimer. Um, so I, I think in Lanark, it probably was uh, the most most popular place for it. But if you include that as Greater Glasgow, then certainly it could be the Glasgow tradition. But there were, there's a couple other, you know, Ayrshire as well. Ayrshire was a big mining place, uh, big mining communities there. And, uh, you know, I had one story about Ayrshire being Robert Burns, but there is another one that uh, came to mind. And this one is in relation to football, junior football. Now, I don't, junior football is not uh, age-related. It's just as opposed to professional football. And junior football leagues were very popular with miners in mining communities. And this story is about um, a team called Glenbuck Cherry Pickers. Now, Glenbuck was where Bill Shankly came from, who went on to become Liverpool manager, very famous. And this was uh, his nephew, Roger Hines, was also a, a, a football player. And he was being interviewed on television after Bill Shankly had died. And he talked about the Glenbuck Cherry Pickers being a junior team who had actually produced a high number of professional players. And then he quoted a story where Glenbuck Cherry Pickers were playing Ardeer, which is a, another 
place in the Ayrshire. And Ardeer had brought along with them a band as well as their supporters. And then it says, as usual, in the second half in junior football, a fight broke out, which resulted in the crowd and the band mobbing the pitch with the result. One of the Glenbrook cherry pickers was battered with a dulcimer. So that's, I don't know whether to include that as the, the dulcimer in football or the dulcimer in there. So, but that brings us to the end. Okay, so if anybody has any questions on that, then feel free to ask. Yeah, Bill. Uh, that was absolutely brilliant. I enjoyed every moment of it. The soundtracks were great, and it the whole thing was superb. Just, just a, a small thing. You mentioned at, at one point there, there was a guy who was actually building dulcimers, and I, yeah. I was looking at the pictures, and some of them seemed to be quite distinctive. They were quite deep in cross section. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I wondered whether there was a local uh, building style of dulcimers, or they were just sort of taken from other places or not. I, I, I don't know. It's hard, it's hard to say because I wasn't too the same. The ones that Jim Barr was making, he'd get plans, and I think it was maybe the plans from the Smithsonian Institute in America. They have they have plans online. It was, it was something they got online anyway, so it wasn't in a traditional style. Yeah, and, uh, and in the first part, you, you'd mentioned that one of the dulcimers that was reported from the 18th century was four inches deep, and it struck me that was a bit deeper than most modern dulcimers would be. And I didn't know whether, you know, that style of building had continued to, to later on or not. Yeah. I don't know. Did it say four, four inches deep? <laughs> it, it, was, it was one of the, it was in the first part about... Uh, well, it, well certainly the, the ones that um, Wally Burke and Jimmy McDonald were playing were quite deep. I don't know. If it could have been four inches, you know. Jim, um, Wally Burke still somewhere, he said when he got that, um, I think 1912, I'd said he got it, it was 100 years old, he was told by the man that gave it to him that it was 100 years old. So, you know, and it was quite a big instrument. Jimmy McDonald's was quite a big, quite a deep instrument. And I think Andy Fagan's was as well. Again, yeah. Andy had probably had that since uh, the 1920s or something. The other interesting thing was the black soundboards. I had a Victorian one to repair many years ago that had a black soundboard. Makes sense, you know. You probably see the strings rather better, actually. Yeah, I don't know. My strings are generally black anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's true. That's true. That's true. And I, I noticed, I wanted to ask you, there were, um, there were a lot of young people hanging around watching over shoulders. Yeah. Um, do you know of anyone who actually younger people who actually started playing the dulcimer or it's not it's not a family tradition i i guess no i, I don't actually well I don't, the only young ones that i knew were playing one of the players after them i said i had to ask kind of stopped after 1988 i was only in occasionally and then i sort of lost touch with them and i think it was in maybe 1998 99 there was a fire in the people's palace and it had to close and they relocated to Motherwell, to the, the Heritage Centre in Motherwell. And somebody told me about it, and I went to see them there. And they were all different players, because all of these ones that you've seen on the videos, apart from apart from um, John Crichton and Nan Kirkpatrick, all the rest had died by that time. But, you know, bearing in mind that in, in 1985, Wally Burke was 85, um, <laughs> Jimmy MacDonald wouldn't have been much less, uh, no, Frank Brown. So one of the really players good. there, John McShane, Hey, Pat McShane, sorry, who hadn't been playing that long, but was very good. He was all, also played the, the tenor banjo and the mandolin. And he taught at Cultus. I don't know if you have Cultus groups in England. It's an Irish traditional music. And they, they teach the kids and everything. So Pat taught at that, and he had um, yeah. three young people that were learning to play. And they asked me to come along. So I went a couple of times, but I got a bit fed up because the, the group itself, the Cultus thing, weren't really interested in the dulcimer. I had suggested that the younger ones to encourage them if they could sit in. They had a junior band, a junior Kelly band. If they could sit in with the Kelly band and learn some of their tunes. And you know, they thought that was a great idea. But when they approached the, the Kelly band, there was no, no, there's no place for a dulcimer in a Kelly band. Mm. But because it's all geared up for competition. And the cultus organization is very rigid in what they accept yeah. for you know for a band and a competition. So I kind of I, I kind of lost interest in it then, 
I know that one of them is a, is a young girl and uh, she was still playing up until fairly recently, I know that, but she moved over to Ireland, so I don't know if she's still playing or not. Jack, that was that was amazing. Um, the timing and just everything that you did and it was so so interesting. Thank you so much for the big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jack. Thank you. Thank you.